whether working in product formulation and development or performing production quality control, accurate, reproducible data is important. Achieving that requires careful experimental technique, appropriate experimental design, and thorough evaluation of results. Hello, my name is Kadeen Mohammed, Applications Manager at TA Instruments, and I am pleased to introduce you to Strategies for Better Rheology Data. In this three-part series, we will cover instrument and sample preparation, testing guidelines, and potential artifacts in your data. Additional resources and links to other presentations in this series can be accessed by clicking the resources widget below. If you have any questions during or after the presentation, feel free to ask them through the Q&A window and they will be answered by TA application scientists. In the first segment of Strategies for Better Rheology Data, we join Dr. Greg Kamikowski, who will help us to understand instrument operation and important considerations for sample preparation and loading. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the presentation on strategies for better rheology data. The presentation is divided into three segments and will be presented by TA Rheology Specialists. The first segment will deal with understanding the instrument and sample preparation and loading. These are the topics that will be discussed in the presentations. The first, as we said, is understanding the instrument then we'll go to sample preparation and loading. The other segments will include testing guidelines for flow oscillation and transient tests, identifying source of, sources of artifacts, and our advanced accessories. If you've attended TA Rheology seminars in the past, you know that we usually begin these with the definition of rheology. Rheology is the science of the flow and deformation of matter. And as this slide shows, there is such a wide variety of materials that are run on our rheometers. Materials like uh, automotive tires, uh, foams, various elastomers, milk, dairy products, hand creams, uh, just a, a, a number of things so that for us rheology application scientists, no two days are ever the same because rheology is such a, a wide and encompassing field. We also say that rheology is the study of stress and deformation relationships. And when we use the word stress, we, we are referring to force uh, that's normalized to take into account uh, the, the, the geometry that we have and the, the material's dimensions. So we try to get these relationships between the, uh, the stress and deformation to get these intrinsic properties of the material that we're analyzing. In this slide, we say that flow is a special case of deformation because in flow, your material is constantly being deformed. And we try to get these relationships between stress or deformation to characterize our materials. And the fundamental relations are called constitu constitutive relations. And the two relations that we have are actually very straightforward. We have the stress, which we've mentioned, divided by the shear rate. The shear rate is a measure of the velocity of the fluid. And shear stress over shear rate is referred to the viscosity of the material. For more solid-like materials, we look at the, just the amount of deformation, which is called the strain. And the stress over the strain is referred to as the modulus of the material. We begin with an introduction to some of the, the terms that we will be using to uh, describe the rheological data that we have. In this slide, we show what is called steady, simple shear flow. And the situation that we have is we have these two parallel plates that are separated by a gap H and in between we have a fluid. We put the upper plate in motion with the velocity capital V0. The force necessary to get that velocity is F and the area of the top plate is A. The bottom plate remains stationary. 
Now, if we did a flow visualization study, what we would see is that the velocity of any one of these particles inside the gap, oh, sorry, is related to its height, y, above the, the bottom plate. So we can propose a velocity profile with the following equation, that the velocity is y over h times v0. So if we plug in y is equal to, to zero, we see that the particles that are in contact with the bottom plate are moving with the velocity of zero. If we plug in the particles that are at height h, we see that these particles are moving with the velocity capital V0. Essentially what we're saying is that we are not getting slippage between the particles and the plates. And we have this linear relationship between the velocity and the height y above the bottom plate. We define this fundamental flow parameter that we call the shear rate. And it's designated by the symbol gamma with a dot over it. The dot refers to a time derivative. And that's equal to the change of the velocity in the x direction versus the change in the y direction. For this very simple system, the, uh, the relationship uh, that uh, comes out is that the shear rate is equal to capital V0 divided by H. So this is the fundamental flow parameter in rheology. It's not velocity, it's the shear rate that we've described here that is a, a better way of describing the motion of our fluid. Similarly, we want to normalize the, the force. And to do that, we, in this case, we just divide by the area of this plate. And uh, the units of, of force are newtons. The area would be square meters. And newtons per square meter are referred to as pascals. There are some uh, operators that still prefer using dynes per square centimeter but the uh, preferred units are the SI units, which are pascals. If we take the ratio of the shear stress to the shear rate, we get the viscosity of the material. Going back to uh, looking at the, at the shear rate, let, let's just look at this term a little bit more. The velocity will be in meters per second. The gap is in meters, so meters per second divided by meters will give you reciprocal seconds, okay? So if we take the viscosity as the stress divided by the shear rate, we can see that the units of viscosity would be pascal seconds in the SI units. In many publications, the, the preference uh, was still to use the CGS units, which are in poise. And as we go to lower viscosity material, it's often more convenient to use units like uh, the centipoise or the millipascal seconds. The good thing about these is that they're all related by factors of 10. So one pascal second would be 10 poise, and one centipoise is actually one millipascal second. So there is an ease of conversion between uh, the different units. One of the things that we can do when we want to characterize our materials on our rheometers is to look at the viscosity as a function of shear rate. This is an example of the uh, flow curve that we would expect for a thermoplastic melt, an undiluted thermoplastic melt. And what we see is at the low shear rates, the viscosity is fairly constant. And at some point, we get into this uh, shear thinning region where we get what we call pseudoplastic behavior where the material uh, has a viscosity decrease as a function of the shear rate. And for a lot of industrial polymers, what we will see is when we plot the viscosity and the shear rate on a log-log scale, we get to this region where the uh, viscosity changes uh, versus the shear rate uh, in this straight line, this linear fashion. And since we're using a log-log plot, what we can see is that we can express the viscosity by this relationship, that uh, the viscosity is this factor m times the shear rate raised to a certain power. 
So for that reason, we call this the, the power law region. This is a very useful uh, relationship uh, in uh, the processability of thermoplastic materials. Um, one other thing is that the, um, the low shear rate region is generally the most sensitive region in uh, observing differences between materials. As you go to the higher shear rates, a lot of times things come together. But it is in this lowest shear rate region that we can see uh, the differences between resins accentuated. And what we see in this box here is that um, the zero shear rate viscosity is proportional to the weight average molecular weight raised to the 3.4 power or, or thereabouts. What this means is that a 10% increase in the weight average molecular weight of this thermoplastic melt will result in a 40% increase in the zero shear viscosity of the material. So again, this is a very sensitive way of looking for differences in materials um, that can be on, on, uh, from other analyses that may appear pretty much the same. So uh, instruments such as our rheometers are very useful for discerning differences in these low regions that uh, result in differences in uh, processability uh, that uh, some customers might experience. Changing over to more solid-like materials, we have the same kind of shear deformation that uh, we've described with, with flow. Now we're looking at a solid material, and we are doing, uh, typically what we'll do is an instantaneous deformation of the material. So in this case, instead of looking at the strain rate, or the shear rate, we're looking at the strain. And we have this same kind of relationship that that the strain for this system is this deformation divided by the gap. In this case, we used Y0 as the, the gap. And uh, again, we use our stress, uh, which we've described before. We take the ratio of the stress to the strain, and that gives us the modulus of the material. And when we're working with shear deformation, we use the letter G to denote the, uh, the modulus of the material. Similarly, um, most of the time uh, when we use uh, shear stress, we will use the, the, the symbol sigma, although there are publications where, where you will see the letter uh, pi, or not the, you will see the letter pi used for stress, uh, or tau. Uh, tau is, uh, actually tau is more often used than, than pi. But uh, we will use uh, sigma for the shear stress, and we use a gamma dot for the shear rate and gamma for the shear strain. And uh, we use the Greek letter eta, kind of looks like an N to denote the, the viscosity of the material. One of the tests that you can do with our instruments is called stress relaxation, which is a, a test that is done uh, like uh, that, that which is illustrated here. So with our instrument, we would uh, rotate the upper plate if we were doing parallel plate testing, and we would just hold it in that position. And for the material that we have here, which is uh, soy flour, what we see is that the stress will decrease as a function of time. This is, as I said, what we call stress relaxation. Now, I have a, a little element here. We're going to talk about these in, in, in a little bit. This has a spring and, and what we call a, a dash pot. And sometimes we can use these, these physical models to help us explain the viscoelastic behavior that we see when we do the testing of materials on our rheometers. So let's, let's go into this idea of viscoelasticity. So when we have a solid-like material or a, a pure solid, we depict that with a spring. And the key feature about the deformation of a spring is that this restoring force that we would feel when we stretch the spring is entirely dependent on the displacement. It is independent of the velocity uh, at which we're pulling the, uh, the spring. On the other hand, 
If we have a pure fluid, we illustrate that with this object that we call a dash pot. And it's just a, a cylinder laid on its end over here. And we have a, a piston in there and we have this uh, filled with a fluid. And what we would see in the case of fluids is that the, the resisting force is dependent on the velocity as, and is independent of the position. So it's just the opposite of what we have with a solid. Remember the solid, that force was dependent on the deformation. It was totally independent of the velocity and it's just the opposite for fluids. The vast majority of materials that our customers work with are going to be somewhere in between pure solids and pure liquids and we refer to these as viscoelastic materials. So sometimes we will uh, depict the, the behavior that we are seeing by putting a spring in a dash pot. Here we're doing them in parallel. In the prior example, I showed a spring in a dash pot in series. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take these, um, what we call Voigt elements, and we'll make a, a series of these to to model the viscoelastic behavior that we are seeing in our rheological testing. So um, when we have viscoelastic materials, the, the response that we get is, is very time dependent, as we're going to see. Okay, one of the examples of a, a very nice uh, viscoelastic material is uh, polydimethylsiloxane, which is uh, abbreviated PDMS. It's the main component of silly putty. And what you would see is if you took, uh, if you uh, balled up a little sample of uh, PDMS and you threw it on, the, on the, the, the table here, what you would see is it would bounce, okay? And bouncing is an indication of elasticity of the material. And this is also a very small time scale that, that we would see. Uh, this, this bouncing. But if I were to take that same wad of, of silly putty and lay it on the table here, given it enough time, you would see it flow out. So now it's a much longer time and we are able to see the flow properties of the material. But you can see that with this material, we have components of both viscous and elastic nature, okay? So, um, with that introduction, uh, now we will get into the uh, uh, idea of understanding what the instruments actually do to give us these uh, viscous, elastic, and viscoelastic measurements on our materials. TA Instruments actually makes four instruments for doing rheological testing. In today's talk, we will focus just on our rotational rheometers and of the rotational rheometers, we have two models, two distinct models that we, uh, that we sell. We have the Aries G2, and sometimes in, in our presentations, we will use the term native mode. For the Aries G2, the native mode of uh, deformation is strain control. You'll also see us, uh, hear us use the terms SMT, that's separate motor and transducer, or dual head. And we have illustrations that will show what we mean by these terms. We also have the DHR rheometers. Their native mode is stress control, or the torque control, okay? We will call these combined motor and transducer. These are single head instruments. And uh, you would use a rheometer for, for fluids, definitely, but it also has the capability of doing a lot of testing on solids and solid-like material, which we'll discuss. Sometimes, though, it, when you have a, a more solid-like material, it's a little bit more convenient to test it with one of our solids rheometers. Uh, example would be if you wanted to look at the viscoelasticity of a film. Uh, it's more convenient to test it in a linear fashion with our, one of our DMA instruments where you deform this in a tensile mode. Uh, sometimes you can get re rectangular bars which you would um, also test in a, um, a flexural mode as well on a, a DMA. We have two kinds of uh, DMAs as well. 
uh, the RSA G2 is like the, the linear type of rheometer, which is a counterpart to the Aries. We have the DMA Q800, which is more akin to the DHR rotational rheometer. So with solids rheometers, we test things primarily in a linear deformation. With our rotational rheometers, we test things in a rotational type of, of deformation. Okay, so what, what does the, the rheometer, rheometer do? It can measure both the viscosity and the, the viscoelasticity of materials and solids, and it will give us these terms that, that we've just mentioned. We can look at the viscosity of a fluid as a function of shear rate. Sometimes we would like to look at something as a function of the stress. For perhaps it would be something that has a, a yield stress. We can look at viscosity as a, as a function of time. Uh, if we have a structured material or a paint or something like that, when you first start shearing it, you'll get a viscosity, but, but as time is uh, increasing, you'll see a viscosity decrease with, with time, and that's what we refer to as thixotropy of that material. We can look at viscoelastic materials as a function of, of temperature, which is what we do with uh, dynamic mechanical analysis. We can look at it at, uh, as a function of frequency, and um, dynamic frequency sweeps are very good for looking at the molecular weight, molecular weight distribution of polymer melts. And we can do uh, stress strain testing and, and uh, a number of other tests to get the, the viscoelasticity of, of our material. Uh, we have transient responses, which are unidirectional tests, okay? Viscosity testing up here, typically that's a unidirectional test. Viscoelastic testing is usually done in a dynamic uh, mode of testing. Transient is unidirectional, where you do stress relaxation, you deform and hold, as well as uh, applying a stress or a torque and looking at the, uh, the amount and the rate of deformation, which is what we call a creep test in uh, transient testing. Okay, so again, we give the, the, the definition of rheology, you know, the study of flow and deformation, study of the stress-strain relationships, and the key things that we will be concerned about when we do our rheological testing are the torque, the angular displacement, and the angular velocity. These are the three machine parameters that we will use to get the rheological parameters that, that we're after. So torque, uh, since this is a rotational rheometer, this is the counterpart to force. So this is simply force times distance, and since it's rotational uh, rheometry, we're interested in the torque. How high can we go? How low can we go and still get good sensitive measurements? We're also interested in angular displacement. You know, what's the, the, the lowest strain, the, the lowest displacement we can go and still feel confident that we're getting good data? Or how big of a deformation can we go and, again, be, be confident in our data? And we're also interested in the angular velocity. You know, how, how low can it go and how high can it go before going into, into overspeed? Okay. These are diagrams of the two kinds of rheometers that we, that we sell. The, uh, the rheometer on the left is an Aries G2 type of rheometer. This has what we call that separate motor and transducer design. So when you do a test on an Aries rheometer, the deformation is actually being done on the, with the bottom fixture. So we, we do our, our flow, our, our oscillation, or our, uh, let's say, stress relaxation testing by imposing the, the deformation when in the bottom fixture, and the upper fixture remains stationary. And the transducer measures the torque, and we have a, what we call a forced rebalance transducer which measure, measures the amount of power that's needed to keep this upper plate, in this case it's a plate, it can also be a bob if you're doing concentric cylinder testing, it could be a, a cone, um, but this measures the torque that is being transmitted through the, the, uh, the sample. The other type of uh, 
instrument that we have, and this is the design, the design for the, the, uh, the DHR rheometers, is the combined motor and transducer design, also called the single head, where everything is happening up here. So the way these rheometers work, these DHR rheometers, is that we apply a torque through this non-contact drag cup motor, and we measure the response, the, the deformation, and the rate of deformation with an optical encoder. And as you can see, everything is occurring up here with the measurement. The only thing that's being done here is uh, that the, the, this is also used for, uh, for temperature control but the real action is happening in the, uh, that upper head. So the question would be, well, why are, are there these different designs for rheometers? And uh, one of the, 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 the key benefits of the Aries rheometer is that this provides you with an inertia-free measurement of the, uh, the viscoelastic properties of your material. Um, now, that being said, there, there is a lot of overlap between uh, what both of these rheometers can do. Um, when you get to some uh, very weak structures, some like weak, uh, weakly structured materials, and you, you want to uh, characterize the, the viscoelasticity at, let's say, a frequency of, of one hertz, you may get into um, inertia issues with a, a single head rheometer. Whereas if you did this on an Aries, uh, you would not have that issue. There are also some strong points for the DHR rheometers as well. And, and in fact, we will sell a lot more of the DHR rheometers than we do the, the Aries. But both of these are uh, very uh, excellent instruments for getting the viscoelasticity of our uh, customers' products. These are the uh, actual pictures of uh, both of these uh, rheometers. So we have the Aries G2 rheometer on the left, and this is the, the most common configuration that you see for the Aries, and that is with what we call the force convection oven, the FCO. And uh, another benefit of the, the Aries instrument is that with the force convection oven, you can get up to your desired temperature uh, very quickly. It's, uh, uh, and another thing too is there is a lot of uh, airflow or uh, gas flow when you're using the, uh, the force convection oven. The, the, the benefit of that is that you have a pristine environment. So if you have a material, uh, you might grab a polymeric material right out of the reactor, maybe add a little bit of stabilizer, and run it on your Aries rheometer with a, a nitrogen atmosphere, and you'll get good measurements. You will not um, see the degradation of the material uh, that quickly with, with that design. Um, on the right, we have a picture of our DHR rheometer. Again, combined motor and transducer, or single head. Uh, this shows the, uh, peril, this, the Peltier plate uh, being used for temperature control. There are a number of others as well. There's the, uh, the environmental testing cham chamber that we call the ETC. That's used for a number of polymer melts uh, as well as torsion rectangular testing. We have upper heated plate, we have um, uh, electrically heated plate, and uh, you'll see this later on. We have concentric cylinder geometries as, as well. Okay, so when you uh, look at the, the capabilities of a rheometer and, and are looking at how you can design your test, you need to be aware of the limitations of your, of your instrument and uh, the things that will define the, the uh, accessibility of various uh, regimes in the, the, the data collection will be the following uh, parameters, the, the, the torque range, the angular resolution, the angular velocity range. And um, although we are working with rotational deformation primarily, um, it's also important to know what is the normal force range. And by normal force, we mean like an, an axial force that at times you will experience as you're, you're loading a sample and you're going to encounter some resistance that you can measure by looking at the, at the normal force or the, the, the axial force. And uh, a lot of times 
normal force is also useful for characterizing materials such as, as polymer melts. And another thing is what is the, uh, the frequency range of, uh, of your material. Now we can, we can give you these um, uh, ranges for the different rheometers. Uh, a lot of times it will depend on the customer sample to determine uh, what, what range is, is really necessary and um, also what geometry would be the most useful to work with to get the data that, that you're really interested in. So on, on this slide we have uh, a lot of information on the specs on, on the Ares G2. So we, we give you the specs on the, uh, the force transducer in, in both the uh, the torque, so we give you the, the lower torque limits for um, oscillation and flow, and we also give you the, the maximum value that the, uh, the, the torques can give you. Um, we also have um, the axial force range, so we can go up to uh, 20 newtons of force with, uh, with the Ares G2. Here are some uh, specs on the motor. Um, uh, both this column and uh, the, uh, the column over here. And we also have a, a listing of the def different temperature systems and you would select these based on what kind of sample that you are working with. If you uh, are working with the polymer melt, the forced convection oven would be the, um, the oven or would be the, the temperature control system of choice. Uh, but we also have some other uh, temperature control systems like the uh, advanced Peltier system, uh, just a regular Peltier plate and, and a sealed bath. And um, you would use a Peltier plate uh, also if you were doing uh, like a UV curing testing on, uh, on the Aries G2. Okay, so with the Aries line of rheometers, we just have the Aries G2. With the DHR line of rheometers, we have the three rheometers that we have shown here, the DHR1, the 2, and the 3, and we list the different specs for, for each of these. The DHR3 is our top of the line uh, DHR rheometer, and looking at the specs, you can see why it, it has that, uh, that designation. The DHR2 is our mid-range. Uh, again, the, all three of these are, are excellent uh, rheometers. Um, a definite improvement over the prior generation, which were the uh, very useful and very successful AR rheometers. Um, these DHR rheometers have, uh, uh, are the next generation uh, after the AR rheometers, and each one of these is, uh, is a marked improvement over the capabilities that we had previously. Oh, every one of these has a, a magnetic bearing. So previously with the AR rheometers, it was only the ARG2 that had a magnetic bearing. And uh, now all three of these DHR rheometers have the uh, magnetic bearing. Okay, so when you uh, decide which rheometer you want and uh, what testing you want to do, you would ask yourself, what is the, the, the level of performance that, that you should expect? Um, Please realize that when we give specs, we determine those based on the best case scenario. Just like if you get a car and you get the highway a mile per gallon rating, that's pretty much what we are doing here as well, in that these are under the, the best case scenario, this is what you'd expect. And this is good too, because you know that below that, the, the data are are somewhat questionable. And sometimes we've seen where people will actually go sometimes half of a decade or, uh, or lower below the specs and they'll still get good data. But we'll give you the specs that we are comfortable with in a, a best case uh, scenario. So um, what you need to ask yourself is what, what is the level of performance that, that you need on, on your samples. So if I have a, a super a viscous asphalt sample, I'm not going to test it on a 60 millimeter uh, plate or I'm not going to use the uh, concentric cylinder uh, geometry. Uh, similarly, if I have uh, something that's in the viscosity range of water, um, I I'm not going to use an 8 millimeter diameter uh, geometry and, and expect to get good data. So um, we can, 
when we pick our instruments, the instruments can be designed to test just about everything. As you'll see in, in one of our future slides, we'll say we can test everything from water to steel. But it has to be equipped properly to get you in the right range to give you meaningful data. So when you actually set up your rheometer, a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, rheometers, a little bit like people, rheometers need air. They, they need air to breathe. So uh, we, we need to get uh, a nice clean air supply into the rheometer. And when you do the uh, installation of the rheometer, when our, our service technician will do that, uh, he will also install a filter system, whether it's an Aries or a, a DHR. You'll have a filtering system that will catch some of the extra uh, oil and uh, moisture particles that, that we don't want getting into the, uh, the rheometers. One of the things that has been a development with our, um, the DHRs is that the, 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 uh, the, the gaps within, um, that be between the walls, has gotten bigger, so there's less of an issue of contamination uh, due to any particulates that might work their way through. We, we, we hope that never happens, that you, know, you get some particles going through, but uh, with the current design, that, that is less of an issue. But still, we want to make sure that we get a good clean air going into the rheometers when, when we do our operation. Another thing too is, is to be careful where you locate the, the rheometer. In, in most labs this is not a problem, but sometimes uh, you can put a uh, rheometer somewhat close to a, a fume hood that when, when you are using the fume hood to remove uh, noxious vapors, uh, it, it will vibrate. And I've been in locations, too, where um, the, the, the facility is located near a, a, a train line. And when the, the freight train goes by, you, you can feel the vibration. So uh, what you would need to do is to uh, go to a, a, a lower floor and, and put the rheometer perhaps on a marble slab because you want to isolate it from these extraneous vibrations. So you, you want to do things like have the good air supply in a good location, uh, to, to maximize your chances of, of successful data uh, acquisition. Uh, another thing, too, that, that we'll see is uh, sometimes, in, in, like, for example, like in, in an asphalt facility, uh, people have the, the rheometer very close to the door, and people are going in and out all the time. So that can affect your data, too. So, you know, if you could remove the rheometer from an air draft, like, like an open door or, or something, or keep it away from, um, of, uh, from air coming in, like air conditioning or heating and stuff like that, um, that'll increase your chances for, for successful rheological measurements. Okay? Uh, if you are using a Peltier plate with, uh, with either of our rheometers, uh, you will need to have a circulating fluid. Most of the time, this is something as simple as, as water. And currently, the uh, circulating the circulator that we are, are selling is a closed system, which is an improvement over what we used to call the fishbowl that we used before. And uh, the thing is that we, we need to keep the, uh, the circulating fluid clean. We, we don't want it to start building up uh, you know, fung fungus and, and stuff like that, which can clog up uh, the flow in the, uh, the circulation of the Peltier plate. And you know that when you run a, a, a Peltier plate, you must always have water circulating in it. So check your, your, your levels at, on a regular basis, change it once a month, and, um, and when you do that, you, you, you will not have any problems with any, uh, any growth uh, in there that, as we said, we, we don't want you to clog up the, uh, uh, the circulation in the rheometer because you can do damage to your, your Peltier plate, okay? And uh, on here, we also uh, advise that uh, you keep the area clean where, where you're doing the testing. Uh, a lot of times, this, this, is, this is not a big issue, but you know, for me personally, I've had experiences where I've worked with asphalt and I, I wear my lab coat and I don't wear good clothes and then I do my testing and uh, I clean it up and to me everything looks good and the next thing I know I take off my lab coat, I put my arm on the counter and when I come up I see some stains of asphalt. So avoid that, you know, you don't want to 
dirty your clothes if, uh, if you don't have to. So keep that in mind. Okay, um, it's a good idea to uh, keep an eye on your rheometer to make sure that you are constantly getting uh, good data. One of the uh, features that we have here at TA is what's called the, uh, the hotline. And, and perhaps some of you have called in to us and, and you've, uh, you've mentioned that you've, you've had some uh, questionable data. One of the things that we will most likely recommend to you is, have you run a viscosity standard lately? So we, we want you to do calibrations and we want you to, to do checks on standard materials at, at regular intervals. Uh, a lot of times we'd, we'd, we'd uh, suggest monthly checks on, on your, on your uh, instrument um, just so that you, you are confident that you're, you're getting the best data you can on your rheometer. So if you do get strange data, it, it could be um, maybe the test isn't set up right or maybe there's something uh, wrong with the, the, uh, the sample labeling. So th these are things to keep in mind. We want, we want to make sure that you can uh, reject the notion that there, there's something not right with, with the instrument. So uh, when, when you first get your rheometer, the, the rheometer will be uh, carefully calibrated at our uh, uh, manufacturing facility and we, we recommend using uh, standard oils that you can get. Uh, you can check for a few vendors uh, online. Uh, you can get uh, polydimethylsiloxane from us, uh, which is polydimethylsiloxane that we have characterized on the rheometers that we know are, are very much in spec. And we will provide you certain parameters that uh, uh, if you are within that range, you can have confidence in the, uh, the measurements from your rheometer. You can also get oil standards if you're looking at characterizing the, the Peltier plate or the concentric cylinder. Uh, here we give a, uh, a procedure where we, we say go from 0 to 88 pascals uh, on uh, a material like S600. Uh, here we're talking about 60 millimeters, 2 degree cone. You can use a, a plate as well. The typical run time here would be 3 minutes, but you could make it longer than that if, if you want. And what you would do then is you would plot the shear stress versus the shear rate and use our software to calculate the slope of that line. And the slope of that line will be the viscosity of the material. That should agree to within 3% of the value that you would see printed on, on the jar. And as I mentioned, if you're uh, going to be running something with the ETC or, or the oven, specifically if you're, doing, you're going to be doing something like uh, polymer melts, uh, you, you want to look at the, the viscoelasticity of polymer melts. A material that's very good to run is PDMS. And if you purchase that from us, we will give you the, the two parameters. We'll give you a crossover modulus, and we'll, we'll describe those things later, and the crossover frequency and the acceptable range. So run that uh, on, on a regular basis to, to make sure that the rheometer is performing as it should be. Okay. With the DHR instrument, you can uh, do a, uh, you, you can have a torque calibration performed by a service engineer. This is part of the annual preventive maintenance visit. Uh, but you can also buy an accessory where you can check the torque on your own. When you get an Aries G2 rheometer, uh, you will automatically get a calibration kit which will include uh, weights for testing the torque as well as the, uh, the, the normal force. And within this kit, you will get um, polydimethylsiloxane and you'll get a, a standard fluid that you could run on your instrument to make sure that you're getting the proper data. Okay, so we've talked about the machine parameters uh, that we have on these uh, the different rheometers. And the goal of, of what we're going to do is we want to transfer the machine parameters into rheological parameters. We, we, we want to get data that are, are useful to a rheologist. So the parameters that were the machine parameters we're going to be working with are the angular displacement, and we'll give that in, in radians, the 
the angular velocity is the, the, the uh, change of the angular displacement with time, and uh, we'll denote that with the, the Greek letter omega, and in this case, we're using the letter m to denote the, uh, the torque. So what we will do is we will find these appropriate factors to multiply the torque to get the shear stress. We will multiply the angular displacement by an appropriate factor to calculate the, the strain. And, and these factors are dependent on the geometry of our material. Is it Conan plate? Is it parallel plate or concentric cylinder? And it'll also depend on the dimensions of our, our system. So if I'm working with the parallel plate, is it uh, 40 millimeters? Is it 60 millimeters? Am I working at a height of, of one millimeter or a half of a millimeter? Those are the, con those are the um, issues that are addressed to calculate that, that factor. These factors are actually pretty straightforward to calculate, as you're going to see in, in, the, uh, in the following slides. So to calculate the viscosity, uh, we just get the stress over the shear rate, and uh, that's uh, determined by a factor times the torque, and we want to make sure that the, the torque and the angular velocity are within the spec of the instrument, okay? If they're outside the specs, then the data are questionable. And these factors, as I said, will depend on the, the, the type of uh, geometry as well as the dimensions. To calculate the modulus of the material, uh, we get the stress divided by the strain. And in this case, it's torque, once again, divided by the angular displacement. And the factor here, this k gamma, is the same as k gamma dot. Okay, now, uh, but those will, will differ from k sigma, which will be used to convert the torque to the shear stress. Okay. One of the nice things about rheometers is that you can run things over an extremely wide temperature range. You, you might need to change your geometry uh, as you go from a low temperature range to the high temperature range, but you can go typically from minus 150 up to 600 degrees C, so uh, at least in theory. You know, and you know, that doesn't mean if your material is going to degrade at 300 degrees C, then you're not going to go above that temperature. But with a, uh, a DMA, uh, those are used primarily to test things in the solid state. And at times, that, that it is actually more convenient. If somebody were to give you a film and they said, I really need to know the viscoelasticity of this film as a function of temperature, the first choice would be to use a, a DMA and you'd probably run it in, in the tensile mode. But as you get beyond the melting point of this material, uh, you would not be able to get a good characterization of this in, in the tensile mode. So you would need to go to a rheometer and the, the, the best geometry for that would probably be the parallel plate. And you would do this dynamic shear testing on your sample. Um, you can also do uh, shear testing and find out where your material is going to solidify. You can go to the low temperature region. The, the one thing to keep an eye on, if, if you're going to low temperatures, if your sample gets, gets very stiff, you, you can start getting into compliance issues. So that's just something to, to, to keep in mind. But uh, the rheometers give you a very wide range of, of temperatures over which you can characterize your materials. This slide shows what are the common geometries that are used for a characterizing material. They, they all have great usefulness, so that, that's why we, we sell different, uh, different versions of these. And uh, as we like to say, uh, with a, a single rheometer, you can go from everything from, from water to steel, and that's uh, assuming that you have the right geometries. So, uh, on the left here, we have a concentric cylinder geometry, and uh, this is used primarily to test coatings, paints, and, and materials like that. Um, the nice feature about the, um, the concentric cylinder is, is that there's a lot of area that's exposed to, to the deformation. So, if you start to get a little bit of settling in the particles, 
uh, it's not that bad. It's not going to have that much of an effect. And if we have some excess material above this, this bob, um, evaporation is not as bad of an issue as, as it could be if you have a Conan plate or a parallel plate. With the Conan plate, and, and we'll get into each, each one of these uh, designs individually, but uh, the Conan plate has some uh, benefits. What uh, you can see is if you go through the, uh, the engineering mechanics of, of this design, you see that the, the shear rate and the shear stress are constant everywhere in this gap. And um, uh, another very common geometry is the parallel plate geometry. Um, one of the nice things about this is that you have some flexibility in terms of the height that you want to uh, run your sample at. And if you have a material that, that is essentially solid and, and it can uh, sustain its own weight, uh, you can test things in this torsional geometry. So uh, if you want, if you had a, a rectangular plastic piece, you can, you can do a, a DMA type of test where you look at the, the viscoelastic properties as a function of temperature. Okay, so let's, let's go over these uh, one by one. With the concentric cylinder, uh, which has been used for a, a, a long, long time to, to characterize uh, uh, materials uh, and, and paints and, and coatings, as well as things like suspensions and, and slurries, um, one of the, 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 the disadvantages is that it, compared with some of these other geometries, like the Conan plate or the parallel plate, uh, this requires a, a more volume than, than the others. And sometimes cleanup could be a little bit more complicated and a little bit more of a mess than it is with, with the other uh, geometries. So here we've shown the, the strain constant for um, the concentric cylinder geometry. Uh, as well as the, uh, the stress constant. And if you are new to the field of rheology, it would be a good practice for you to, to look at the, the, the raw data. Like, it would be good to look at the, uh, the angular velocity data and go through the calculations using the constants that we've given here to make sure that you are getting the shear rate uh, in, in our software that, that you are calculating manually. Um, and do that for the stress as well. Look at, at your torque, multiply it by this stress constant, and verify that that is the stress that is being given to you in the, the, the data table from our software. You know, in, in many, uh, many of our customers who are uh, heavily regulated by the FDA, they, they need to show that the TRIOS is, or TRIOS is our software, but the software package is validated so that you know, you, you know that you know that your instrument is calibrated and you're getting the right torque values and you're getting good angular velocity numbers. You can convert that to the rheological parameters and you're getting the numbers from the software that you've calculated manually based on the dimensions of, of your geometry. So here are the, the concentric cylinder uh, uh, factors for converting the, converting the machine parameters to rheological parameters. And uh, these are the pluses and, and the minuses for uh, the concentric cylinder. And again, these are used uh, very often for things like uh, paints and, and coatings, and there's a lot of uh, history to, to working with these. Uh, these show that the different kinds of rotors as well as cups. And these are the, the, uh, the systems that we have for the, the DHR rheometers. I would say the most common bob that is used is what we call the DIN rotor, and that's the, uh, the bob that I'm, I'm pointing to right now. It's got a bit of a, uh, a cone on, on the bottom. And this is the one that's been around for the longest time. Uh, it does require a, a, a large volume, and by that I mean probably around 20 to 23 mils of, of material. We also have a, another design that we haven't shown here, where this is actually, the, the bottom part is machined out, and um, there's a, uh, uh, so we have the, another bob that, that can be used to, to get the, the, the viscosity. It requires a, a, a less less of a volume, more like about uh, six and a half uh, 
uh, milliliters of, uh, of fluid to get a rheological characterization. Now, uh, one of the things that we are concerned about as we go to uh, more and more filled type of materials, I mean, if you start with a, a fluid and then like if we start adding some pigment or adding more materials, we may get into a situation where we, we have a structured fluid or with, especially like with a lot of particles, it, it, it might get somewhat solid. We would be concerned about things like slippage. So if that's the case, uh, we start looking into other uh, bobs instead of the, 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 uh, the, the conical din um, is the, uh, are these veined rotors. And um, so we have the veined rotors and uh, again, the, uh, the din, the other uh, bob that I was thinking about is what's called the recessed end uh, rotor. So a little bit of this is removed and it uh, doesn't really contribute to the measurement and it lets you get away with less sample volume. But uh, so we have a couple of these uh, veined rotors and uh, these are useful for slurry materials. Um, we also have a, a, another rotor here. Uh, this is called the starch pasting. I've heard it called the impeller or the propeller. Uh, this is used for a particular test that is used to characterize starch. And there is a standard procedure for looking at the, the pasting of starch as, as you heat it up and you stir it and the outer layer will break and it, that's referred to as the pasting of the material. And, look, and you look at the viscosity of, of the material as a function of, of time and temperature. And the way to keep the, uh, the material stirred up in this, uh, this mixture is to use this impeller that you can see from the design it is, is well designed to get good mixing of our materials. There have been some people that have used this for other materials besides starch just because it provides a uh, very good mixing. Um, we also have a helical rotor that uh, some people use on some structured materials to get uh, the, the viscoelastic properties of, of these materials. And in some cases, um, our customers have used uh, what we call a double gap rotor, where uh, when, you, when you load your sample with, with this rotor, you put it in here and you fill up your sample, there is fluid actually on both sides of, of the rotor. So you're getting like twice the exposed area. Um, sometimes that might get you down to some lower shear rates to, to get uh, more of a measurement. But uh, a lot of times you, you can get a very good characterization just with the, the regular um, DIN rotor. So, so these are the different rotors that we have for the concentric cylinder testing. Now we go to the, uh, the, the cone and plate geometry and for the strain constant, this is simply one over beta. Um, and beta is the, the cone angle. These are typically uh, two degrees, one degree, half of a degree. But if you're going to make this calculation, the calculation of the strain and the strain rate constant, you need to convert that cone angle into radians. And in fact, uh, a lot of the times with, with the Aries um, cone geometries, they'll give you the, um, the angle in radians, although most people are more, more used to looking at the angle in degrees. But if you're going to make that, uh, that calculation of the strain constant, you would use beta in degrees. And another thing to note uh, is that this is dependent only on beta, uh, only on the, uh, the angle. There is no dependence on, on the distance from the center. So in one of the earlier slides, I had mentioned that a nice feature about the Conan plate geometry is that the shear rate and the shear stress are constant throughout this gap. Okay, so sometimes this is useful for looking at non-Newtonian materials. Uh, sometimes this is a, a very useful geometry if you're doing polymer melts, okay? And here is our, uh, our stress constant that would enable you to convert the, uh, the torque to the shear stress for, for this geometry, okay? We make a, a number of, um, of geometries of, of different uh, diameters and different angles 
depending on the, the, the type of material that, that, that you want to work with. And um, if we were to take a worldwide survey of, of people, uh, especially with our DHR rheometers, and they say, I use the cone geometry for my testing, the most common would be the 40 millimeter, two degrees, okay? Um, now, when people run uh, materials that are somewhat lower in viscosity, uh, they'll go to the 60 millimeter. And I've seen a lot of 60 millimeter, two degrees, as well as 60 millimeter, one degree, okay? And uh, this was the, the 60 millimeter, um, two degree was what we had mentioned for checking a viscosity standard, like S60 uh, or RS600, um, to make sure that you're getting good rheological data. Um, usually it, it's not a big issue which geometry to put, pick. There is a lot of, of overlap between the, uh, the different geometries. So it's not like this is right and, and these are all wrong. A lot of times it's this is right and this is right too. So it's not like a, a, a yes or no. It's yeah, this and this would, would be acceptable geometries for characterizing a certain material. One of the things about using a cone and plate, um, cone and plate geometry is that uh, you need to run it at a particular gap. When you purchase a cone geometry, what you would notice is that you're going to get three numbers. One is the diameter of the cone. The other will be the cone angle. The third thing will be the truncation. And the truncation gap is the gap at which you would need to run your experiment to get the best data, okay? So we show here that the, the typical measurements, the typical truncation gaps for the different angles uh, are, are these values, 20 to 30 microns if it's one degree, about 60 microns if, it, if it's two degrees, and 120 microns if it's four. One of the um, concepts that we have in the world of rheology is what we call the 10 to 1 rule, which says that we want our gap to be at least 10 times the size of our largest particle. So if, if we're running with a, uh, a cone geometry, and let's say we're using a 2 degree, uh, that means that our truncation gap is going to be around 60. That means that the highest diameter particle that we could work with will be about 6 microns, about one-sixth of that. Um, and sometimes that could be very restrictive to the, the materials that our, our customer has. Another issue with, with going to a very small gap is when you start working with higher molecular weight materials, higher viscosity materials, and as you're squeezing the material down to the target gap, you're going to generate these axial forces, these normal forces. And sometimes it, it could take forever to get to the target gap that you need to be at to get the best data. So for that reason, for some high molecular weight materials, the cone and plate is not a very practical uh, geometry to use. It's because it is restricted to that, that gap. Okay, so again, uh, as is the case with, with every one of these uh, uh, geometries, there are advantages and, and there are disadvantages. And uh, the, the nice thing about the Conan plate from a, a theoretical standpoint is that the shear rate and the shear stress are constant everywhere in, in that gap. Okay. Uh, probably the main limitations are that you have to run at such a small gap and that will preclude testing materials that have big particles or material that's somewhat high in molecular weight that generates an excessive normal force as you, as you squeeze it down. Okay, then the, the next geometry that we'll talk about is the, uh, the parallel plate. Uh, of all the geometries, this one is the one that is probably the most used. And again, if, if we were to take a, a worldwide survey of geometries that are used on our rheometers, especially the DHR and, and the AR rheometers, I'd say it's the 40 millimeter parallel plate. 
And uh, the most common gap that people use is 1,000 microns or, or one millimeter. But, but you're not restricted to that. And, and that's the nice thing about the parallel plate is you can run it at, at different gaps. Um, the, the one limitation would be is you can't go so high that your material will start coming out of the gap. Uh, then, then that would be too high. But um, one thing about the, uh, the, the parallel plate is that the shear rate and the shear stress will vary as you go from the center you know, along the, the axis here to the edge, okay? And uh, when somebody says that they've done a parallel plate uh, test on a rheometer and they've, they've gotten viscosity versus shear rate, chances are that they are giving you the apparent viscosity and the apparent shear rate, and those values are the value at the edge, okay? As I said, it, it va the, those values the shear rate and the shear stress will vary from the axis, from the center, out to the edge. But when you just give the, the, the basic data, what somebody is referring to is the data at the edge. Now, there are ways that you could convert the parallel plate data to Conan plate data, and that's available in our software packages. So if, if you need to compare data and either your customer or vendor just has the, uh, the Conan plate and you have the parallel plate, you can do testing and you should be able to get a good comparison of your data using the correction factors that are available to go from parallel plate to, to Conan plate data, okay? And with the parallel plate, just like what we saw with, uh, with Conan plate, is you, you, uh, you can vary, uh, you can get to different flow regimes in shear rate and shear stress based on the on geometric considerations. Uh, if you want to go to high shear rates, uh, you'd use a 60 millimeter plate. Um, if you want to go to higher shear rates with that, you would decrease your gap. And because at the same angular velocity, you would get a higher shear rate at the lower gap. Similarly, uh, the stronger your material is, the lower in diameter you'll go. Uh, again, 40 millimeter seems to characterize uh, just so many things that uh, our customers want to work with. Uh, as you go to lower uh, uh, or higher viscosity materials, uh, you'll go to the lower diameter. And for things like uh, some asphalt samples, people go to 8 millimeter diameter. Uh, for some of these pressure sensitive adhesives, they go to 8 millimeter diameters as well. So uh, this gives you a little bit more flexibility than does the, uh, the Conan plate. And as I said, this is, this is used so much in uh, the world of uh, uh, polymer melt rheology. For polymer melt rheology, the most common diameter is 25 millimeters at a gap of, uh, of one millimeter. And again, we go through our, our table of what the advantages and the, the disadvantages are for, for parallel plate. And as I said, uh, the, the shear rate and shear stress aren't constant, but they can be corrected. And as is the case with, with all of our um, geometries, um, in a lot of cases, when, when you go beyond a certain angular velocity, a certain uh, shear rate, you're going to get flow instability. And that, that can show itself uh, in terms of uh, if with you're using the Conan plate or the parallel plate, the material can come out of the gap, okay? Um, and sometimes if, if it goes really fast, I mean, and it can, it can fly out. So sometimes there are uh, rheologists who on their lab coat, they'll have a little band here that was a sample that got flung out of the, out of the rheometer. But even with um, the concentric cylinder where you, you might think, well, it's confined in there, after you go beyond a certain shear rate, you can start getting these uh, vortices. And you might see that the, sh the shear stress will actually decrease as you go to higher shear rates. And if that's happening, then you're in a, a region of flow instability and you're not getting good data, okay? So here are some uh, thoughts on, on some representative materials that our customers will, uh, will evaluate on our rheometers. So, uh, you, know, you, you can look at things and, and actually get a feel for the viscosity of the material. So if it's 
low viscosity like uh, like milk and something you know even uh, olive oil and, and glycerin and stuff like that those flow pretty easily you can run those on a, a 60 millimeter geometry as you go a little bit higher in in viscosity a 40 millimeter would be more appropriate uh, you know if you're working uh, at a, at a candy factory and uh, you want to get the viscosity of, of caramel, 20 would be more appropriate. And again, it doesn't mean that the 40 wouldn't work. It's just you'd probably feel better with this. And uh, again, there's a lot of overlap with the different uh, diameters that uh, you'd be, uh, be working with. And as you go to very high viscosities, uh, especially somewhere around uh, room temperature, or if you're working with a pressure sensitive adhesive at room temperature, eight millimeter is the, uh, the geometry diameter that, that we would most likely be using to characterize our materials. So uh, when, when you look at your, your data, uh, most of the time what people are looking for is, uh, you know, give me a, a geometry and give me the test conditions that will give me good data. Most of the time, people aren't that picky that they say, well, I really have to know this right on the edge of the, the instrument sensitivity. Most of the time, people just say, I want to get a good, reliable, and uh, reproducible measurement of the, the rheological properties of our material. And uh, with the, the geometries that we have uh, available and, and doing the right test type, you should definitely be able to, to get a good rheological characterization of, of just about any material that, that you could be working with. Okay, so this is a, an example of, uh, of a flow test that you would do. This was done with a 60 millimeter, a one degree cone. And the purpose of this test was to verify that we're going to get uh, good uh, viscosity measurements on our, our uh, rheometer. So we're running, um, this was actually water with just a little bit, of, little bit of surfactant. If you were to run water by itself, you would see the effects of surface tension in the low shear rate region. The material would look like a, like a non-Newtonian shear thinning material. And then as you go to the higher shear rates, you're going to get into flow instability. So by using a, a surfactant, or what I used was silicone on, on both the bottom and, and the top uh, geometry, um, we, we removed the, uh, the surface tension. As you can see, we, we got good measurements to, um, to, to low shear rates. And this showed that we were able to get good measurements to about uh, 80 uh, nanonewton meters. So, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, when you talk about micronewton meters, it indicates that, boy, that's a very sensitive measurement. And now we're going into uh, less than, than a, a tenth of a micronewton meter. We're going into the nanonewton uh, meter range. And if we had used a, a, a viscosity standard uh, other than water, we, we could probably, we, we could extend this down to, to even lower torques. And, if you've seen our, our presentations on the DHR, and we have one for the Aries G2 as well, where we will show you uh, what the specs are and how far down we've gotten in torque with some of these viscosity standards, you can see that it, it, it's very impressive that we can make these measurements at, at such low, low torque values, and they would be reliable. So, uh, you know, and what you would do is if you were to do a, a, a test, a lot of the times the, the accessible range for your material is going to be a lot more restricted than it is for these ideal samples that, that we're running. So keep that in mind. You know, just, just because you, we say that we can get to these uh, very low torque values for your material, if you have things like a uh, uh, water that, that has surface tension or um, for some materials, like if you're looking at toothpaste at certain rates, uh, you're going to get slippage. You know, the, the, the rheometer could go to the, the angular velocity that you want. There, there, there's no problem there. But the data itself uh, will become questionable because of some other uh, factors, which will be discussed in, uh, in our subsequent presentations by other uh, rheology specialists. Okay. 
Now here's a test that was done on a concentric cylinder a geometry with uh, different paints. And the uh, idea that we wanted to get across here was that it's really important to characterize material like, like paints over as wide of a range as shear rates as possible because in their usage, you know, whether uh, when they're being made and processed and uh, conveyed and, and uh, put into the, the paint cans or whatever, uh, to storage and then application by, by a consumer and drying on the wall, um, the material will be exposed to a very wide range of shear rates. So in, in our instrumentation, we, we will go over uh, as wide of a, a shear rate range as possible to show what kind of behavior you can expect. And uh, sometimes what is useful to see is just by changing a formulation uh, of a paint or of a coating, you're going to get not, not only changes in the, the absolute number, but you're, you can see how some of these things have different shapes when you, uh, uh, when you change the formulation and then you run them on the rheometer. So, uh, exactly how that's going to correlate with field experience, uh, sometimes I'm not sure, but this is very useful information for most uh, people who are involved in this case in, in the coatings industry as to what kind of behavior uh, they'll see and what the consumer will see when, they, uh, when they, they get their paint and when they start applying it on, on the desired surface. Okay, and um, one of, the, one of the last geometries that we'll talk about is the, uh, the torsion rectangular geometry. So um, in general, this is, well, this is used in a rectangular geometry. Uh, a lot of people can easily get a rectangular specimen of, let's say, a plastic, and they will do a DMA type of test. And by that, I mean they'll look at the viscoelastic properties as a function of temperature. And they'll get things like the, the, the glass transition temperature, the melting point. They'll get the modulus of the material so you'll know how much strength this uh, material can contribute if it's in a, a, a load-bearing application and, and how high you can go in temperature before you start to lose that, uh, that strength contribution of your material. Uh, we can also accept um, uh, cylindrical geometries and um, some of our customers have been uh, using this type of geometry with uh, some like asphalt aggregates. They can, they can core out uh, asphalt samples and they'll, they'll machine it down to a cylindrical specimen and then they'll do uh, dynamic testing on a, uh, a specimen using our, um, our torsion cylindrical uh, geometry. So that's another uh, geometry that's available and again, this is something that's, that's somewhat solid. Uh, if you were to try to use a film, uh, a thin film, this might be a little bit more difficult. But there are just a very wide range of materials, a lot of uh, specimens that could be run in this torsion rectangular geometry. Okay, here's an example of a test. This was a temperature ramp on ABS material. So you could see the characteristic behavior of the storage modulus where uh, we get this drop in the uh, storage modulus at, at this point here, uh, which is where the, uh, the butadiene starts to lose its contribution. And uh, here the, the storage modulus continues and then at around 100 degrees the uh, acrylonitrile, uh, styrene acrylonitrile loses its uh, mechanical integrity. And you can see these characteristic uh, peaks in the, uh, the, the loss modulus and the tan delta curves for, for this material that enable us to identify the, uh, the, the glass transition temperature of this material. Okay, so that ends the uh, section of, of knowing our rheometer. Uh, remember that uh, uh, the, the, the main things that we're looking at are the torque, the angular uh, displacement resolution and the angular velocity. And uh, when we use the different geometries and we use the appropriate factors, we, we convert the machine parameters into the rheological parameters, which will give us fundamental properties of our materials. Okay, 
In our next section, we will address sample preparation and loading. And uh, now you are familiar with uh, the rheometer itself and you know, you're aware of the, the limitations with, with those parameters I just mentioned. But another very important part of getting good rheological data is to make sure that you've prepared your sample correctly and then you've, you've loaded it uh, appropriately onto your, your, uh, your rheometer and, and you've taken precautions to make sure that your material will be stable uh, when you're, you're doing your testing. And uh, sometimes that could be a challenge. Okay, among the materials that are, are run on our rheometers are uh, these materials that we call uh, structured fluids. And uh, th this encompasses a very wide range of materials as, as we mentioned here. And, you know, even something like uh, milk is a, uh, a structured fluid. I know we've, we've run things like uh, baby formula on our rheometer to look at the viscoelastic properties of our material. So it's not just flow. I mean, when we see something like a, a baby powder or if you get uh, chocolate milk, um, more so than, than regular milk, but regular milk as well, there is a structure to it. There is a viscoelasticity that you can measure with our rheometer. And uh, on the high end, you could look at things like um, toothpaste, which uh, when, when you put it on your, uh, your toothbrush, uh, you want it to have a structure so that when it's, it's resting on top of the bristles, it's not going to just automatically sink down into, into the gap there, but it'll, it'll stay up on your bristles until you're, you're ready to, uh, to brush your teeth and, and you're going to make, make the toothpaste flow. So, there's a wide range of these, and the, the problem with a lot of these structured materials is, is they could be very sensitive to uh, mechanical and environmental conditions. So, um, you know, when we work with some of these things, uh, a lot of them uh, have structure because there are these particles inside them, and, um, and then they will interact with each other to, to give the structure. But uh, depending on the particle size, that, that may preclude the use of uh, cone, and, uh, cone and plate geometry or, or even uh, parallel plate. And uh, you may have to use uh, um, a, a vein geometry to get some good data on, on some of these materials. Uh, one of the things I should mention at this point, but even with the uh, parallel plate geometries, I think the examples that we, we've uh, discussed so far, you, you get the idea that it's just a smooth geometry on the bottom, a smooth geometry on top. We do have cross-hatched variations of these so that you can get a better grip on your sample uh, to avoid slippage, or, or at least to, to delay it for a while to get, to get more good data. So that, that's something that's useful for some people who are using um, uh, the rheometer to characterize their, their structured materials. And um, a lot of these properties can, can be very time dependent and uh, the, the way you load your sample onto the material can affect the, the, the final results that, that you get. And uh, at, at times there's a lot of effort that goes into uh, writing up your, your procedure so that you are confident that you're going to get good, meaningful, and reproducible data. So uh, we have some uh, 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 tips over here, and there will be more tips given in some of the other segments that are part of this uh, presentation. And uh, low viscosity fluids are, are often uh, 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 the, the, one of the easier things to, to characterize, uh, you know, especially if they're viscosity standards. With those, you usually don't have to worry too much about evaporation. But, um, but if you do have a, uh, a concern about evaporation, many times you can use um, the variations of our solvent trap to, to minimize the amount of evaporation and give you enough time to get good, uh, good measurements. If you have um, a material that, that has some uh, particles in it or maybe uh, it's just not it's not perfectly homo homogeneous you know you you obviously want to stir the material to make it as homogeneous as as possible um, 
you know, sometimes when you open up a can of something and you can see some separation there, uh, you, you know that it, it needs to be homogenized before you, you, you can believe that you're going to get good reproducible data. Okay, we'll talk about some uh, loading techniques with, uh, with these uh, uh, low viscosity fluids as well. One thing that we, uh, we mentioned here is you don't want to uh, put any material back in, uh, in the container just to, to avoid any kind of uh, contamination. Sometimes things like paste and, and slurries can offer some uh, unique challenges to, to getting a, a good uh, rheological characterization. So if you have something like, uh, like dough, um, you might want to think about using the, the parallel plate maybe with the cross-hatch geometry, uh, cross geometries top and bottom. Uh, you may want to go to a little bit higher gap because of some of the, the particles. And to avoid evaporation, a lot of times we'll put on a, a layer of mineral oil. That, that won't affect the, the, the viscoelastic measurements, but it, it will inhibit the, uh, the evaporation. So, um, and uh, if you don't use that, sometimes you can see a crust developing on the side and, and you'll start seeing that the, um, the modulus, especially the storage modulus, going up with time uh, because of the crust being formed around the, the edge of your, of your dough sample or, or something like that. And uh, so uh, things like slurries, you know, if they, if they settle and then they form a cake, uh, you know, you don't want those to, to form a real solid cake and, uh, and, and potentially ruin your, your rotor and, uh, and cup. And uh, gels uh, can also be uh, very sensitive. Sometimes if, if, you, uh, you, know, if, you, if you load them in a, in a somewhat aggressive manner, you can destroy some of the structure that either will, will not come back, it is irreversible, or it'll take just a very long time for the, the structure to come back uh, to its fully developed state. And, and often that is where you want to make this measurement, is when the material is in its fully developed state. That relates to things like the, uh, the, st the stability of the material. It relates to how hard the material will be to, to start flowing. So um, we would like to get that fundamental characteristic of the material in its fully developed structure uh, as, as a characteristic of that material. So, and that could be a little bit challenging. So uh, we go back to how you would handle and load a, a low viscosity fluid. And in this case, what we're doing is we, we put a, uh, a certain volume and um, one of the features in our Rheology software packages is that if you enter the correct geometry and the dimensions and all that, the software will give you the, the absolute minimum amount of material that, that you're going to need to perform this test. Now, for a very low viscosity fluid like, like what we have here in, in the slide, um, you might put down even just a little bit less than what is called for uh, from the software. And uh, what we suggest that you do here is uh, rotate the, uh, the upper head. In this case, it's a DHR with a angular velocity of one uh, radian per second. So you can go into the software and set one radian per second. And uh, while you're loading the, the fluid, and uh, you can put the upper head in rotation with a, a gap of, with a speed of one radian per second. And it's actually better to use radians per second than shear rate because when you get a certain shear rate, uh, when you lower it, it actually is going to increase. Uh, so you, if you lower it, it's gonna start accelerating and really you just want it to go at, at a certain rate. And then what we, what we find is that when, when you go down to the test gap, if there's a little bit of, of a void, uh, you need to fill that up to get good measurements. And the way you do that is you can, you can use a, um, a pipette and just add you know, a few drops at a time until the gap is completely full. And, and, and it's very interesting looking at 
the, um, the, the screen uh, on the rheometer head of something like the DHR, when you're doing this, you can see what effect it has. Like with each drop that you have, you'll see a noticeable increase in the viscosity of your material. And hopefully when it looks good, you know, just you, using your, your visual judgment, you'll, you, will, you will be right around the, the viscosity that, that's listed on the, um, on the bottle that, uh, that you got this, this standard from. So uh, when you're done with that, uh, you can stop, you can click stop the motor, and then you're, you're ready to, uh, to start your test. And uh, when we load the uh, paste and slurries, you know, depending on what their constituency is, uh, you can uh, just uh, uh, take out a um, sample with a, a spatula, and uh, you know, if it's a less viscous material, as we suggest here, you can use a syringe if, if you cut off the, the, the tip. Sometimes that's a very convenient way of, of getting sample and then loading it onto, uh, onto the, the Peltier plate in, in this case. And, and in this situation, we actually suggest getting like about a 10 to 20% exit. And then we are going to go to the trim gap. And um, once we get to the trim gap, we're going to lock the bearing we're going to trim the excess material, and then we're going to go to our, our final gap. Now, because of the, the sensitivity of some structures that, that we could be working with, with paste and slurries, uh, we suggest that you, that you use the exponential gap closure to go to the, the, the last few uh, microns in the, um, in the descent of the head that's been found to, to be more gentle and that has less of a chance of, of disturbing your structure. So um, we want to show you what, what things should look like when you have a, a good loading. Um, obviously you don't want to have any kind of a void uh, between um, the, the, the plates here. You know, you don't want to have any sample where it looks as if sample really does belong there. So here you can see that there's this void. With this, we would be getting an erroneously low value. And sometimes if you run something that has some volatility, um, what you'll see is that uh, you might start out with a good measurement of the viscosity. As time increases and maybe there's some evaporation, it's going to, to look like this and your viscosity number, numbers will start coming in lower than they should, okay? So here is an overfilled sample. You, you can actually, you know, if, if you overfill it, you'll see uh, viscosity coming in higher than, than it should. And, and some things vary with how sensitive they are to this uh, uh, overfilling. And then here it's, uh, you know, it's uh, just right. So, uh, um, you know, here it, it, there's a, a little bit of a bulge to the sample, that's okay and uh, we should get good measurements when, when we have this filled in, in this fashion. Okay, so uh, we mentioned that we, we would like to give a consideration to uh, closing, uh, the, to the way that we close the gap, and we would like to do this in some cases as gently as possible. So if we go into the options and we go into the, the, the gap, you'll see that there are some uh, different ways that we can control the way the head goes down to uh, go to the target gap. So we have linear, exponential, you could use force uh, to, uh, to, to do that. So uh, in this case, what we're using is a strictly linear uh, way of closing the, the gap. So here we go to some, uh, perhaps this is going to take us to the trim gap and then we're going to use a, a certain linear rate to, to get to the desired uh, test gap, okay? So it, it goes down in, in this fashion. However, if we had chosen a, uh, an exponential closure, notice that there's a little bit of a, there's a little difference here in how the, the, uh, the head will go down. And this is a bit on the, the gentler side of uh, closing the, uh, the gap. This can also take a little bit longer. So, uh, you know, if, if your material is not this sensitive, you can use a convenient linear um, 
uh, pattern for closing the gap. If you are concerned about the sensitivity, you do have that option of using an exponential gap closing, okay? So this is an example where uh, we close things very quickly on a linear, uh, with a linear uh, scheme. Uh, here we've used an exponential. And as, as we had mentioned, the concern that we have with this rapid linear uh, closure is that we may be destroying structure that we really would like to get in our measurement. And sure enough, we see that there has been some destruction here of the structure. It, it's building up, but after a thousand seconds, it's, it's still just kind of approaching what we had at the beginning with our exponential closer, okay? Our exponential closure. So if you, if you uh, have a material that's sensitive, you have this option of closing things exponentially to avoid this, um, this damage of your, of your structure, okay? Um, this is a, uh, um, an interesting geometry, not used all that, that often, where uh, you do have the option of uh, using a container, and, and the classic example of this would be a, a paint container where you can, you can get your, your paint just coming off the line, and you can put it on this, this lower uh, cup holder, and this would be a top a Peltier, although you would really just do this temperature at room temperature. You can put it in and lower your, your DIN rotor or your recessed end rotor, and you can get the, uh, the viscosity of the material and, and see if you're, you're getting um, the viscosity versus shear rate that, that you expect to get for your product. So. Uh, uh, this is another option that people have. If you don't even want to worry about transferring, like you, you can get a can and just bring it there. Maybe you want to stir it, um, but you can test it as is uh, atop the, uh, the Peltier plate. Another uh, great usage of using our rheometers is looking for polymer melts, is looking for the rheological properties of, of polymer melts and we can get these in, in different forms. Uh, the, the forms that we show here are pellets, and a lot of the times the, uh, the manufacturer of the plastic, like the, uh, the, of the polypropylene, the polyethylene, what they will do is they, they'll get this fluffy material out of their reactor, they will add a certain amount of stabilizer and they'll run the material through an extruder, and the end result will be pellets and they will sell these to the injection molders, the blow molders, and, and that. So uh, a lot of the times when, when people uh, are looking to evaluate polymeric materials, it's gonna be in the form of a melt. Uh, sometimes you can get the fluff like out of a reactor, um, or, or sometimes there are some other cases where you're, you're getting a, a, a polymeric material and it is kind of in a flaky, or a, a powdery form that uh, you know, we'd like to uh, get the measurements of the uh, rheological properties of. And uh, you know, here we also show the example of uh, a flaky material as, uh, as well. So um, most of the time what, what people would like to do if they have the uh, instrumentation to do this is to make a plaque of your, your polymer melt or the powder or the flakes, and uh, you, you press it at a high temperature, we say 10 to 20 degrees above the, uh, the test temperature, you apply pressure, and uh, you wanna give the uh, material enough time to flow, and then you, you do this slow uh, cooling, and once you take out your plaque, um, you can buy this, uh, this punch from us, but we have this kit, this melt kit, which will enable you to, to punch out 25 millimeter discs or eight millimeter discs for running on, on our rheometers. So uh, for most polymer melt rheology, 25 millimeters seems to be uh, uh, the, the, the best. As I said, if you're running um, some lower temperatures, if you're running asphalt or adhesives, uh, eight millimeters is, uh, is the material, is the diameter of, uh, of choice. So uh, here again, we talk about um, 
molding, in this case uh, molding, uh, molding with uh, powders and, and flakes. And um, one of the things to, to keep in mind is you, you need to know whether your material needs a stabilizer like uh, you know, an uh, antioxidant, uh, you know, one of, the, one of these various uh, materials so that uh, when you want to run your, your melt your, in, in the rheometer, it, it's not going to thermally degrade. It, it, it's got the stabilizer to maintain its properties. And uh, you, you can see changes if you don't have stabilized material, uh, primarily in the G prime parameter. And, and I've seen things change in both directions versus time. Sometimes you can see chain scission where the material will, will go down in molecular weight versus time. Sometimes you can get cross-linking and what that would lead to is, is an increase in, in the G prime uh, as a function of time. So both of those situ situations are, are to be avoided. You, you would like to see at least during the time that you're testing the material that your G prime and G double prime are, are nice and flat. That means that it's, it's nice and stable. So uh, sometimes you will need to add a, a stabilizer yourself to make sure that the material will be stable as a, a function of time for the duration of, of your experiment. Okay, so um, uh, one of the things, when, you know, we, we had mentioned uh, pellets. We'll talk about that uh, a, a little bit more, but one of the things about the pellets is that if you do get it from the, 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 the manufacturer, Generally, those are going to be well stabilized, and you'll be able to run them on our rheometer. Uh, in a nitrogen atmosphere, you will still run it in a, uh, a nice, uh, pure nitrogen atmosphere, but it's not as, as sensitive as some of these powders and the flakes could be if, if you don't add uh, stabilizer to them. So um, when we have uh, uh, semi-solid samples, as we are referring to here, uh, a lot of times the, the thing that you will do is, you know, you'll cut out a, uh, a, a sheet and uh, uh, press it down. You, if, if it has the right thickness, you can put it inside this, uh, this uh, punch press and punch out a, a specimen of the appropriate diameter, okay? Um, one of the things that... Uh, we need to be aware of uh, over and above the, the regular stabilization for some materials uh, like your, your, your nylons, you know, the polyamides, or polyesters, polycarbonate, um, ABS, a number of things uh, also need to be um, dried because they are sensitive to moisture. So if I got pellets of, uh, of a nylon material and I were to run it on the rheometer, I would see the, the, the rheological properties changing with, with, with time, even though they're pellets, uh, just because they, they need to be dried out in order to get good rheological parameters. And uh, sometimes it's good just to do this uh, experiment where you, you take pellets as is and then uh, do a time sweep or take uh, the pellets and dry them, typically like for about four to six hours at 100 degrees C. Um, but you would have to verify whether that is appropriate for, for your material. And do a time sweep and hopefully what you would see is that your, your G prime and your G double prime, that your material is stable as a function of time. So, um, so here we talk about drying uh, some of these materials that uh, are moisture sensitive, okay? So loading a, uh, a disc is, is somewhat uh, easy. Uh, one thing I would add is uh, it, it's a good idea to wear uh, gloves while you're doing this testing uh, because you are working at high temperatures. Your, your plate's going to be 150, 190, 230, maybe 300. So that's, uh, that, that's a very hot temperature, so you don't, you don't wanna hurt yourself. So if you wear gloves, um, and let's say you're working with the molded disc as, as you are here, uh, you, you, you punch out the disc, and you might want to get a, a pair of tweezers to, to load it onto the plate. Uh, sometimes if you're wearing gloves, you can just pick it up and put it on the plate, and it's, it's, not, it's not all that uh, um, dangerous. You know, it, it, it works pretty well. Then what you'll do is you, you'll lower your head, and... Um, 
One of the things you'll keep an eye on, as, as we mentioned in this uh, box over here, is that you will monitor the, the normal force uh, as you're getting to your trim gap, okay? And uh, you, you could do this a couple of ways. You know, you, you, you can set your gap to go to, to, to the trim gap, and you, you, you'll max out on, on the uh, normal force. Usually it'll, it'll react by just holding it at that normal force and keep going down. Some people feel a little bit more comfortable by saying, let's control the normal force. They'll say, I want to impose maybe 20 newtons or 30 newtons. And then you could say, stop when you get to a certain point. And that point will typically be the trim gap. And as we had mentioned in a previous slide, if you're running at a, a thousand microns, which is the most common gap for a thermoplastic melt, uh, your trim gap is going to be 1,050. Some, some people prefer to go to 1,100 for your trim gap. It's a little bit more. But um, you want to go to a trim gap and then use the uh, appropriate trimming tool to trim the excess material uh, from... Um, from your sample, you know, you, so so you do the trimming, and then um, you close your your oven, and then you go down to your to your test gap. Okay, now with uh, with pellets, with both the, uh, the the DHR rheometer and the Aries, we we have versions of uh, melt rings, and uh, the example that we've shown in uh, this slide is uh, the setup that we have for our DHR rheometer. And uh, with the DHR rheometer, you get this little aluminum strip, and when you, when you uh, fold it on itself, there will be like a little hook that will uh, maintain it as a ring. And this ring will rest atop a stage. You have a, uh, the 25 millimeter diameter plate on the bottom, but it goes out to 40 millimeters on the edge. So there's a little space that can be used to put your, uh, your melt ring, and it makes a little well for your polymer pellet. So you can load that up, then you go down to, your, um, to the desired gap, and uh, when you go down, you can remove the, uh, that, that ring. Uh, it's usually a good idea to hit um, uh, bearing lock when you do that, so uh, just in case your, your, your uh, upper geometry wouldn't start rotating and you move that, and then you go down to your trim gap, you trim the sample, then you go down to your, your target gap, and you begin your test. Okay, so with, uh, with pre-preg, many times you have to put multiple layers uh, atop each other, and um, so you, uh, you will stack three, or fi three to, to five layers of these uh, pre-pregs or the adhesives, uh, put them in the oven to the, uh, to the temperature that you want, and um, then you may need to use normal force to get to your, your desired gap. And then, uh, you, you know, depending on the specimen you have, you may need to do some, some trimming or, or, or not. But that's how we would work with the pre pregs So with, um, with normal force, uh, a lot of the times you, you want to keep an eye on this to, to avoid going to the upper limits of, of what the rheometer is, uh, is made for. So when you, when you go down to a, a, a given gap and then you do your trimming, what, what you would like is for the, the normal force to be as, as close to zero as possible because there's the concern that, that you would get these extraneous effects by, by squishing down on the sample. So that, that's the ideal is to uh, get that measurement without the imposition of uh, an extraneous normal force. Sometimes you can't do that, uh, depending on what material you're working with. So the, the best thing is to report the, the data, uh, and, and if you do have a, a normal force, uh, then, then that's fine. Then just make sure that that's reported, that that has been applied to your sample. And sometimes we actually do want to apply a normal force on certain adhesives just to make sure that we're really getting a good contact between the plates and, uh, and our adhesive. Now you don't want to, if you have a, like a tape or something, you don't want to have any kind of a, um, a gap and sometimes the best way to do this 
is to impose this axial, this normal force to make sure that you have uh, good contact. But uh, a lot of times when, when we do this uh, gap closing, um, we don't want to exceed the limits of our, uh, of our instrument. And as we mentioned in this uh, statement here, uh, this may take forever if you're using the Conan plate geometry. So if you use the Conan plate geometry, uh, sometimes it's, it's good to uh, change to the parallel plate geometry. This definitely gives you more freedom and it's a, it's a lot easier to uh, load your sample uh, into the rheometer. So um, anyhow, uh, control of normal force is, is something that you have at your disposal to do uh, the appropriate loading of, of your sample. So in this case, we actually showed that by, by doing a, uh, a faster uh, uh, closing where we did 100 microns per second, and then we uh, let the material relax at a certain gap, it actually turned out to be better than when we used uh, 50 microns. With 50, we developed a certain uh, normal force, but you can see it, it's, uh, these are still, you know, taking a while to, uh, to relax. So, um, you know, depending on what your material is like, you could find better uh, rates to use. You know, you try to get that done as, as, uh, as quickly as, as possible, but without having any long-term effects on your, your measurements. Okay, so um, when, you, uh, when you go to your gap, typically what you'll do is uh, you'll go to a, a trim gap that's 5% higher than, than your target gap, and then ultimately you'll go to your final gap, and, uh, and again, we, we, we keep an eye on the, uh, the speeds for, uh, for closing just so to, uh, to avoid any extraneous effects on the measurement on, on our sample. Okay, that, uh, that concludes the, uh, the, the second part of, uh, of this presentation, and hopefully this has had some uh, information that is useful for you in uh, picking the equipment that's appropriate for your material and in uh, designing the tests that you would, uh, that you would use in, uh, in your evaluations. There are uh, other opportunities for gaining more uh, knowledge of uh, rheological testing uh, from TA, and uh, I'd like to list a, a few of these for you. Uh, number one, you can look up all this information on our uh, TA website, which is TAinstruments.com, and um, if you go to training, you can see some of the, the things that are available, such as theory and applications, uh, on-site training, quick start, TA tech tips, as well as our applications library. You can go to our applications library, type uh, a keyword, and you'll get uh, a number of, of, uh, of very good articles that will deal with the, the topic that, that you're interested in. So with the theory and applications courses, those, those are held six to eight times uh, primarily in Newcastle, Delaware. Sometimes they are done at, at, at other locations, but the main location will be here in uh, Newcastle, Delaware. And they'll cover the, the theory of the measurement, some of what we've discussed in this presentation as well, the instrumentation, instrumentation design, calibrations, troubleshooting, data analysis, and applications. And uh, sometimes when it's, it's difficult for uh, people to come to the, uh, the Newcastle facility, and uh, perhaps they want a number of people to be trained on the rheological instrument, the best option is to do uh, on-site training. And another benefit of on-site training, in addition to working on your instrument and you're working with your material, you can also have a, a number of people that are uh, uh, attending that and, and are getting rheological training and typically, although we will cover all the, all the fundamentals in that, we will do our best to, to tailor that on-site training class to your particular application. So uh, in some cases, the on-site training is, is the mass, most effective way of, uh, of having many people trained on their instrument. We have some uh, quick start courses that are on the uh, website. Those are about 60 to 90 minutes long. Uh, you can get them any day, any hour of the day, 
and those are free of charge. So, so look those up. With uh, TA Tech Tips, uh, you could go to uh, YouTube and you can see some of these short two to four minute videos that will uh, give you further advice on uh, ways to do uh, good testing on, on your rheometer. And one nice thing about these is that we update these uh, about every week. So uh, uh, every week you try to make it a, a habit to check for some new uh, tech tips in, in YouTube. And uh, hopefully soon you'll, you'll find one that's appropriate for, uh, for your application. Okay, so uh, that concludes our uh, first segment, which was understanding your rheometer and sample preparation and loading. Um, this is recorded and uh, it will be archived and available on our uh, TA website. We ask you to stay tuned for the next segment, which is testing guidelines, and that will include flow, oscillation, and transient uh, applications. And we thank you sincerely for your interest in rheology. That concludes our first segment, Instrument Fundamentals and Sample Preparation. A recorded version of this segment and the entire series is available through the TA Instruments website. Be sure to join us for the second segment in the Rheology series, where we will take a look at testing guidelines.